Welcome back, everyone. Just stand here. Don't don't hold on to the microphone. So, so there goes my whole rock and roll performance, just right down the drain. Um, I am here. Uh, my name is Marie Lopez, and I work for the Vancouver Parks Board. And I'm here to introduce the afternoon's uh, 10 by 10 speakers. So again, we're going to be listening to a group of artists, organizers, uh, professionals in in community engaged practice. Uh, and then following that, we will have our witness reports and then open up the floor for a larger discussion with this group. And we hope to get you all out of here by about 4.15. So uh, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our first uh, speaker for the afternoon, Jay Dodge, who is the artistic producer of Boca del Lupo Theatre Company, one of Vancouver's most innovative and dynamic theater companies. Boca specializes in experimental theater productions and spectacular outdoor presentations, focusing on collaboration with international, national, and regional artists. Jay, I can't see you, but you're out there. Excellent. Should I just press the C here? So my name comes up? Space bar. Um, so here, I'll try to get this sorted here. Is this, is, uh, can everyone hear me okay if I just talk like this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I unfortunately didn't have the benefit of being here this morning and being able to uh, know whether or not anything I'm saying is relevant to the speeches that happened earlier or if I'm contradicting them or saying anything provocative or repeating somewhat, something that somebody else said. But um, what I'm going to go through is sort of, I guess, you know, my personal beliefs on how art and culture intersect with community and then talk about one specific project um, that I feel we did a, you know, a reasonably successful job of bringing them together. So first, my my belief. It is my belief that art can be a powerful force in the creation of great communities when great art is created with the community. And I bristle at the idea that community and art, when termed together, become an excuse for amateurism or a lesser quality of art. Not that I don't believe in a vibrant amateur community. I'm, I am an amateur guitarist and amateur Photographer, I get tremendous joy from those things. My father does half a dozen shows in community theater every year. I love it. He loves it. It's fantastic. But uh, I think, I think, not having been here this morning, what we're talking about here is something a little bit different. Um, as a professional arts practitioner, I'm theoretically engaged in the definition of our contemporary culture through my work. And I think that part of my job is to engender community through my work, along with many other things that art is good at, of course. I don't believe that this process of engaging with community um, takes us off the hook for the quality of the work that we're making. I guess that goes back to my, my first statement. Um, I think that if we set out to to achieve a lower bar because we're involved in some sort of community engagement, I think everybody loses. I think that uh, we don't strive to the excellence that our culture and community can be. I believe that we don't. Um, I think that people leave not with a, a, a better, stronger sense of community and of culture. I think it undermines that if we don't strive for excellence when this idea of art and culture and community intersect. Uh, there are many, many great examples, I think, of when it's very successful. I mean, I'm going to draw on my own experience. I'm a theater practitioner, uh, so my examples are from the theater world, but we can look to organizations like uh, the Leaky Heaven Circus. They create fantastic work with en engaging with community uh, members, uh, everything from, the, from dogs to uh, people with developmental disabilities to professional artists. And all without, in my opinion, uh, undermining the excellence and the, the sort of the, the point of the art that they're making, which is a social commentary of sorts as well as 
tremendously you know entertaining i think they're building community they're creating great art all at the same time there's other great examples like uh looking at marie here i mean the uh, i've seen a number of really interesting works at uh, the roundhouse recently uh people like um you know theater replacement and uh radix i mean they're doing uh fantastic work there that i think does both of those things it engages gauges the community but in the, it engages the community in the creation of great art or at least attempting to create great art knowing that i'm not always successful but i do try um and so here i'm going to just start a little uh slideshow here uh, onto the the piece that i'd like to talk about a piece called la marea i'm going to hit All right, so I think I've departed a little bit with tradition in that I don't have 10 slides. I have one slide show. Um, so forgive me that. Um, La Marea was a piece that we did in 2011. It was part of the Vancouver 125th. It was part of the Push Festival. Um, and it happened over four days on the rain-slicked streets of Vancouver in January on the 0 hundred block of Water Street in Gastown. Uh, over 6,700 people came down over the four days. They all came down, you know, bundled up with their umbrellas and, and took part in this unique performance installation. In my opinion, the show was uh, remarkable uh, in its accomplishments. It involved six storefronts, three other scenes that were happening in the streets. There was, you know, uh, just some of the numbers, there was nine video projectors uh, with surtitles um, that were telling stories uh, that were originally written by an Argentinian director but that had been adapted with a local dramaturge to uh, stories of the people that were, you know, the, the fictional, within the fictional world that we created uh, down in Gastown. And every night it was, it was akin to setting up and tearing down a, a, a you know, a medium-sized on-location movie set, shutting down traffic, cabling, you know, hundreds of feet of cabling, setting up, you know, lights, all these kinds of things. So, uh, not to toot my own horn, but it was like this was a it was a big, it was oh geez, it was it was a lot of work every night, and it took a lot of effort in order to make that happen. And and, and um, so what's so great about this large and handsome project? You know, that's that's not really what we're talking about here, except that you know, except that uh, except for what it took in terms of community engagement and involvement in order to pull it off, uh, and not just to pull it off, but I think. It was much more than just the four days of a handsome production in in Gastown, and that's what I'll get into here. So, um, you know, who was involved? Um, this piece uh, involved a whole host, I, I suppose, different communities. You know, defined communities are defined in so many different ways, but. Um, we worked with uh, downtown Eastside residents. There was 10 downtown Eastside residents that were a part of creating and running the show. We worked with the Gastown Business Association. These were, you know, Gastown storefronts that we were on the streets of Gastown. We worked with, uh, you know, six retail stores. We worked with SFU Woodwards. We worked with SFU School for the Contemporary Arts. And now this is just, that's just that, the neighborhood community that we were working with. And, and out of that, we also worked with uh, the two other professional training programs in the city, UBC and Studio 58, and this was an unprecedented uh, coming together of these three training institutions in the city to formally work together towards creating, uh, creating a project. We worked with the PUSH Festival, we worked with the City of Vancouver, we worked with the Vancouver film industry, and we worked with professional artists from Argentina and Vancouver. So we brought together, from those groups, we brought together, together 60 people, 60 people from uh, disparate communities to work together to create something that at first glance was sort of a near impossible task, you know, in the, it, it, all towards the creation or the striving to create great art. And this is something I didn't perhaps make clear. I mean, it, these are, when I was looking at 
what we're talking about here today and you look at community and you look at culture and I know there's a lot of different definitions of what culture is and what community is and just to be clear from from my perspective or what I'm interested in I suppose is the is the create working together as a community or communities to create a collective contemporary culture whatever that means so um, how did this sort of you know uh, what what was the result, I suppose, of bringing all these communities together? You know, what was extraordinary? How did, what came of it, I suppose, was the next thing that came to mind that might be of interest. And um, what you're seeing behind you here, like I said, it's one slideshow. It's a, it's just an example, but uh, these are, this is, was, this slideshow was put together from a simple query on Flickr. So of the 6,700 people that came down, down there, there are thousands and thousands of photographs that proliferated the social media world. You know, Flickr is one site, there were many others. It sort of uh, spiraled out, I think, from the 6,700 people there, there was tens of thousands that experienced, you know, sort of a transformation of perhaps a street, a part of their city that they had known in one way that would now be seen in a different light. And that's just, that's one example of it, of course. There's, you know, it's, uh, social media isn't everything, but it's easy to put up on a computer here on the screen. Um, of the 60 uh, people that were involved, the 10 members of the downtown east side, the 30-odd uh, students, the 20-odd professional uh, artists from both Argentina and Vancouver, um, many of them uh, still work together now in different capacities. Boca de Lupo in particular, there's, of that group of 10 from the downtown east side, there's two of them that are part of our regular group that come together whenever we're, we're creating work. Um, one of the students that worked on that show is now an intern with us. Um, you know, those are just some examples of, I think, tangible examples of how, how I define community, anyway. Um, and now I think, and I, I, I touched on this before, and uh, I'm not sure um, where I am in terms of my clock. One minute, perfect. <laughs> that's great. Um, but. So, so I guess just to sum up, I mean, that's sort of a lot of, I guess, sort of facts and figures and some pictures, and it seems to have frozen up on this one, but it's a good one. Um, is that um, from that, I think there was a transformation that took place. Working together, bringing together, together these several communities, to, to, like it took us about 12 months to bring this all together towards those four days. And from that, there was a lasting legacy, but there was also sort of a transformation. There was people in the downtown east side, for instance, that would, would come thinking that it was a film set and say, oh, what's the film, expecting that they would have to walk around, but instead they were invited in and saw this, were sort of embraced in this art, art making through, you know, participating a, as a viewer in a, in, in a situation where they used to be turned away. And then there's all the other people in the neighborhood. I mean, that's one example. All the other people in the neighborhood who came there, they, they see the streets now in a different way, the Gastown Business Association is, you know, we met with them afterwards and they're, like, they're saying, well, yeah, you know, we're, maybe we can move away from the show and shine. Maybe we, you know, maybe we can, maybe this can be a place where, where art happens, where we explore who we are uh, as a community, uh, what is our collective contemporary culture. And, um, and I think that happened on many levels with, with all of the different partners that I listed there and the individuals that were part of those various communities that came together uh, for that, this one extraordinary project. So there you have it. Our next speaker is Sabine Silverberg, who is a registered art therapist and expressive art therapist who has been working for the past decade on inner city, inner city excuse me, community-based health care through the Dr. Peter Center. She teaches at Vancouver Expressive Arts here at Emily Carr and at the European Graduate School in Switzerland. Hello, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today and I have a cold so my synapses are not firing as fast as I would like them to be. 
and I might use my paper a bit more than I had hoped for. Okay. Okay. What, what my title referred to is really the large element of the work that I'm involved with, which is uncertainty. And this visual is a, a visual metaphor for most of my life. I know usually about one ingredient and then there's a large open space to figure out what to do with. Um, when I came to Canada about 17 years ago, I shifted my life. I used the opportunity to change, to shift my life from geography to what I wanted for it to be most central, which were art and people. And where I saw that path most clearly opening up was in getting trained in first in art therapy and then in expressive arts therapy. And the distinction might not matter to you as much, and maybe it doesn't really matter at all, but it exists out there in the field. And learning about how to use the arts to facilitate processes and relationships with others. However, as I know, and as you know, every single encounter is different, um, and the shaping of the encounter will depend on all the ingredients in every relational opportunity. What that basically means is we have the arts and we have the relationship and both are creative processes. I've been fortunate to work as a counselor at the Dr. Peter Center for about 12 years now and I suspect that quite a few probably know the place. Just to lay a bit of a foundation of background, just please bear with me. The Dr. Peter Center is an HIV AIDS organization um, with a residence and day health program. About 400 people are registered in the day health program. And we have a small team of six to seven clinical members of nurses, counselors, arts and music therapists, and we see about 120 people a day. Our clients are largely from the downtown east side and consider themselves as uh, living with the impact of marginalization and are considered, you know, as you all know as well, BC's mo most vulnerable citizens. So besides HIV and AIDS, they're often usually living with active addiction, with diagnosed, undiagnosed mental health concerns with recurrent homelessness, with inadequate living conditions. Um, and most of them, if not all of them, have a history of abuse and neglect. So the impact of marginalization in short is that it renders people invisible um, to themselves and to others, and that it deepens a sense of displacement quite often and of not belonging or mattering. One of the approaches that shape the work at the center is harm reduction, and what that means in brief is um, compassionate pragmatism with the, the brief slogan of meeting people where they're at, which we know, you know, lucky for us that we live in Vancouver is uh, prevalent for so many services in the downtown east side. Um, in short, as a pragmatic work designation, it means acceptance and engagement. And what that translates into is offering a place of belonging and one of um, f discovering and nurturing strengths and resources. The idea to bring art students, as you can see here with one of our participants, Bill, who is l a fabulous tour guide every time there's a new group of students arriving at the center. The idea to bring the art students into the environment was to multiply the opportunity to engage with the arts and imagination and to give each group the opportunity to meet, meet the other. So by doing that, hopefully creating an exchange of imagination, of life stories, of learning, of collaboration, um, and of leaving your usual comfort zone in relating and thereby letting go of stereotypes. The students are asked to work within an ethical framework and that is really consistent of one core premise which is listening as an act of respect and thereby uh, drawing on relationship over production. So if in doubt, let go of the great creative idea and go back to the basics of connecting. What those pathways usually look like, um, as I'm sure many of you have talked about this morning when I wasn't able to be here, unfortunately, is that it looks like there's largely three pathways to entering. One is to find a shared entry point of interest and developing that into a collaboration. Two is to bring an art piece, a, a project or a modality for the student to bring to the center something that they're enthusiastic about so that the spark mate might catch. 
and people who feel interested can join and find a path of, of collaboration from there. And three, following um, a participant interest or a client interest into a project. And I'll give you some examples for those collaborations. This is one of the outcomes of one of those uh, cores situated at the Dr. Peter Center. And just to clarify this, for a student to get a tattoo, is that's not my usual expectation of a course outcome. <laughs> <coughs> but what happened is that two people recognized each other in the crowd, a student with tattoos and a client with tattoos, launched into a conversation and he drew a rose for her, and which is one of his preferred uh, tattoo drawings that he likes to engage with. He's often the community, within this therapeutic community, he's often the one who develops a shape for others to later get a tattoo off. So she was really quite enthused by the rose and came back on the last course day with a tattoo on her forearm. And um, he wasn't on site. He was actually at the time in the hospital. So I took a photo of her arm and the, the image. And when he returned to the center weeks later in quite uh, a hopeless shape, I showed him the picture and it made a huge difference for his outlook. It was like this brief moment of a sense of something mattered. Something I did, something I left within this connection made a difference to somebody. Another opportunity, Bahar brought in material to uh, make baskets. And um, Bill really liked the idea and came up with his own repurposing of the basket into a bicycle helmet. And this is an exercise, and uh, Anya, one of the art students, uh, uh, found Jose, who is one of our participants, who frequently paints in the studio, and they spent the whole morning portraying each other, um, which led into a long conversation and multiple storylines. Unfortunately, I couldn't bring, th they exchanged the portraits after, so I was able to take a photo of her image, but he had taken his home already, and I didn't uh, try to make, make him go through the effort of bringing it back to the center. When the students leave, the environment is changed, and this is one of the few small visible impacts people are left with. You know, somebody has a whole new outlook onto Vancouver. He redesigned his shades with the skyline of the city. And what uh, the impact in the environment for almost any, any therapeutic invitation or effort we put out there looks like is usually a small, a small act of visibility. We are not expecting any grand outcomes, but what we are aiming for is, is connection and through the connection to help people regain a sense of agency and supporting each other. And as we know, the community in the downtown east side has a fabulous uh, social support, e mutual social support and bonding network, which re often re-emerges and um, with some support in the center also, kind of then often also, not usually, leads into uh, increased self-care, self-worth, and a sense of belonging and mattering. One project I'm engaging with myself is uh, introducing photography into my work there and trying to find out what people are actually interested in if they have um, access to cameras and support with the technicalities of it. And I don't give them uh, an, a project to focus on, but just follow what interest might emerge. And Bill, again, I actually saw him just before I left this morning to come here, and he offered to come with me and co-present. And I, told, I had to tell him I only have 10 minutes, so that wasn't, for today, that wasn't the right opportunity. But he is fabulous at finding and losing cameras. So the main point for him, really, is to look like a photographer. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I think that's something I really respect, because it means that actually having access to a camera and being seen with the camera is an achievement qui for quite a few people living with addiction because it's a precious object that could easily be sold. And it means you're somebody with a purpose and a role for that moment in time. You're not just somebody who has nothing to do. You have an interest. And he loved especially posing with this camera, you know, because it has this whole professional feel and didn't know how to actually operate it, and it really didn't matter. And then um, Rob, all of the clients and participants actually insist on being called by their real name rather than being anonymized, how it's often a practice in the therapies um, to maintain confidentiality. They all really want to be visible. 
And so one of my um, observations has been that other than people don't always like to focus on what healthcare suggests is important. So it might not be HIV or addiction or mental health concerns or homeless that are important, but a longing for beauty, for finding light, for perceiving things in a different way, for learning how to look more closely and understanding their own aesthetic attractions. <coughs> and in the end, um, always coming back to a sense of community and f looking for a larger social body to present their work within. And uh, you know the importance of identifying with geographically and socially with their network in the downtown east side. I just have to check to see if I have my conclusions available. So in this sense, um, I think at the core of it all lies listening and following in, in the very intimate personal act of meeting somebody. And for me, the arts are a way of meeting the other that relies on all the senses and thereby offers a much more intimate way of knowing each other. And in my experience, that leads to the wish to share, the wish to connect, the wish to spread out and build community. And hopefully, I, I hope that health, op health contexts open an opportunity and an entryway into transcending itself. So poetic nomad as a path of uncertainty, but with the arts. So we have really a lot to gain. Thank you. Delia Brett and Dalek are the artistic directors of Machine Noisy, a contemporary dance company based here in Vancouver with a mandate to foster the research and creation of innovative performances that transcend, <coughs> transcend traditional notions of dance and theater. I also have a cold, so. Yes, and it's Dalek, just, oh. that's okay. Yeah, I'm, mm -hmm. so this, this is it? All right. Um, so we're a Vancouver-based contemporary dance company, and uh, we were just talking that we realized we've been working together for 20 years in some capacity. Um, we both have a, a background in theater, and we both have extensive training in contact improvisation. So it becomes, uh, the basis of our work. It's uh, sort of the underlining uh, st status of our base, of our work. Yeah. yeah. I'm just going to move this down a little bit. So as a company, we're interested in pushing boundaries. And um, to do this, we look for different ways to approach dance. Um, sometimes it's working with artists and other disciplines. And um, for this... Uh, project we're about to talk about, we actually wanted to work with non-professional performers. And so we... So we, uh, yeah, we conceived of a, of a production called Law of Proximity, um, which was a community-engaged project that we presented in the summer in August in this year. And um, the project employed eight queer youth between the ages of 19 and 24. And uh, with this project, we were interested in, in creating a situation in which we could mentor the youth um, <coughs> in the skills of contact and improvisation. And together, we could collectively create a performance. <coughs> um, we were also really interested in understanding, um, well, educating ourselves on, on, the, on the issue, the current issues for um, around identity and around um, queer queer issues, um, and we we're also just really interested in challenging ourselves to to work with non professionals. And 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 then I would just say that finally we were we were wanting to demonstrate for our dance uh, peers that um, that you could still make high quality aesthetic art. Um, and also be engaged in uh, 
social politics. Um, so that brings us to uh, the process. Mm. So we worked, we worked for five weeks with the youth and um, on the sixth, the sixth week we actually did four performances. We worked for five days a week and for the first hour and a half of the, of the, of the day we taught them a contact improvisation class and then we did a four hour rehearsal which we paid them for. Um, <clears throat> and then we also in worked with uh, some new media artists, Sammy Chen and Stefan Smilovich, who brought in um, the interactive technology that we worked with. Yeah, um, I should say, we should say first that we, uh, we did partner, we created partnerships with community and with um, the Queer Arts Festival, and that was really significant to how we, bef before we jump into the process and into the, all this talk about interactive technology, I realized we didn't say that. And uh, with, that, th with those partnerships, we were able to prepare for this process. Um, we, we were able to conduct like a brief workshop the f year previously through the Queer Arts Festival for, for queer youth and just kind of get a sense of what was involved. Um, mm. we, we used those resources to access, um, to get access to, to um, queer youth. We had, we had discussion groups. We had um, these organizations use, use word of mouth to get the idea out that we were proposing, that we were going to create this performance around, around them and for them and with them. Um, and so we were able to get quite a lot of people interested and then that got pared down to eight based on mostly on the, the availability of the youth, the, their ability to commit to the whole six weeks of, of production. So uh, now getting on to interactive technology, one of our ideas about that was that we would create, um, we would give the youth themselves access to technology so that they could have really active uh, choice making. And they could also the whole sort of, uh, uh, what's the right word? The whole sort of mystique of the theater could, be, could become transparent so they could engage this technology themselves. In the middle of the show, you could see the choices that they're making, just a sort of this sense of democratizing the uh, performance itself. And uh, uh, so we worked with Stefan, and, and he decided to use um, an Xbox controller in his system that he designed called the Kinaxis, um, in which you trigger uh, light and sound with your body in front of the Kinect box. We had a Wii controller mm -hmm. uh, signaling, uh, tr um, triggering the camera and the sound, and we had an iPad that they used during the performance to designate spaces and shapes and categories and stuff like that. And an iPhone that triggered uh, music sometimes and a surveillance camera that we used to, um, in this box, to yeah. see what was going on inside the box. And our idea around these, uh, these particular technologies is that we we're hoping that the kids, or not, I shouldn't say kids because they really weren't adults, were, um, were already somewhat versed in, in this kind of technology. That that was the assumption we made. <laughs> Interestingly enough, they were um, they were all really not. <laughs> so it was a learning process for everybody. <clears throat> yeah. So th that kind of gets us back to um, to this notion of that that uh, politically and socially engaged art can also be really good. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to work with this technology to 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 challenge ourselves as artists to continue growing. We didn't see this as something in which we were, you know, um, dumbing our own process down in order to to, to uh, work with people lesser than us. We considered the, the youth our equals and we wanted to create a situation in which we were all growing as artists, so them as well as ourselves. Yeah, good, moving on. <laughs> we had a very diverse group um, within the eight. We um, diverse in a lot of different ways. We we thought we were going to get a lot of um, youth with no kind of training in any kind of performance experience, and we actually got a huge diversity of experience. We had some clowns. We had some physical theater actors. Some uh, swing dancers. Um, what else did we have? 
drag artist. Drag artist, yeah. So uh. it was quite quite fascinating that the skills that they brought into the process. Um, and we were also really happy with the the spectrum of um, of queer that was represented during the during the process. We had uh, two transgendered people. We had people who identified as bisexual. We had people who identified as non-binary. We had um, asexual. Pe people who identified as asexual. Um, we had people who felt mm. they were gay, and you know, and and but. And some people who just felt like they were odd, they were weird, and that that made them queer. Uh, so, yeah. So uh, it kind of expanded our own our our personal mm -hmm. idea of what queer was, and then actually we realized that we fit into that category too. Yeah, <laughs> pretty good. Non-binary is um, is um, a word that's used to describe somebody or some. People who believe, who try to think outside of like male, female, male, female, or just opposites, or, or outside of dualities. So they're neither he or she. So there's one person that we worked with who wanted to be called they, as in mm. the plural. There was we. One of the most important <laughs> things that came out of this whole process was the idea of pronouns and how important it was for each of the of the the youth to have a to be identified as a proper pronoun. And how much um, <coughs> how much time they that they spent trying to find the right label for themselves to really identify themselves, um, and how important that was in terms of, and how brave that was in terms of um, um, being somebody who's queer in this very binary heterosexual mm -hmm. um, uh, environment. Somebody who can go actually no, I'm I'm a he, you know. And to really challenge that mm. system, so we—that was a huge learning curve for us. So uh, part of the process was working with training the youth in contact dance. You want to talk about that? Um, sure. So we 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 practice contact <laughs> dance, and it's a really um, significant part of our creative process. But we also use it because it's it's a really it's it actually is a very um, exciting way to, to explore communication. It's, um, it requires that you, um, well, it's, it, it applies physics to dancing, to moving, and it, it requires shared weight, shared exchange of, of um, energy, of, um, what else am I saying here? You're saying <coughs> it's a study in trust? Oh yeah, <laughs> it's a study in trust. So, so you have to trust yourself and you have to trust your partner. Um, you have, to you have to be clear with your communication of how you're how you're interacting with your partner. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, need for awareness of how how you're coming, how, how much energy you're giving in, how you're s receiving energy. Um, it's about being very alert, so responding. It's it just really opens up the um, the body and the mind for communicating. Yeah, yeah. and it develops and it develops a kind of an intimate. Um, Connection between people, um, inti finding intimacy in another way. Not that's not necessarily sexual, but it's but it's very um, at the same time very honest and very tangible. Mm -hmm. And it's also it's very real. So that's not representation. It's what you see is what it is. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't require any formal technical dance training. So it felt like the right tool to to give the youth in terms of um, finding a common language that in which we could create this production on. Uh, yeah, so we already used this word and it was a big, 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 big part of mm -hmm. this experience for us. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we spent like the first two weeks basically developing trust with the group. So um, creating ensemble, we, we worked a lot on, on s skills to create, to choreograph with, to, um, to bring imagination, to bring their own personal skills into the rehearsal process. And it was always, for us, it was always about giving them the opportunity to, to um, offer us things that they wanted to include into the process. Um, and we also uh, found that we are, had to trust ourselves in this process. We were kind of over our heads in many ways. We had done a community-engaged project before. We were working with people we, we weren't familiar with, people with different kinds of ways of operating, different political beliefs. and. Uh, 
and we couldn't just make the same assumptions that we always make when we work with professional dancers. So we had to kind of dig deep into our own experiences and our own understanding of, of human beings and of communication and, and find new ways and new methodologies um, with everybody. Which didn't always work. <laughs> we, um, about, about two weeks into the process, we had a big conflict with the group and it, it really came down to um, sort of their, their expectations about what they were going to get out of this process and what they wanted to put into it and what we were actually doing with the process. We, um, in, in our opinion, in, in, our, in the way that we work and the way we think, it's kind of a friendly dictatorship. We, can, we make the decisions and the dancers we work with provide the bodies to make, that, to make the work. But that's a sort of understanding that we have as, as dancers in, in the dance world. And for this group, it was very different. A lot of them, they push against those ideas of, of hierarchy. And so we had to really negotiate with them around certain things like, we're making decisions for the whole group because we're on the outside and we can see um, the larger picture. And so we had to find ourselves being more transparent about why we were making decisions and being a little bit more subtle about how we um, asked for, ask for things. Yeah. yeah, how we like why we had we had to explain ourselves a lot more than we than we normally would have to. So it was quite a learning experience for us as well. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, uh, what we came up with was a, a really exciting uh, production um, in which we were able to to just really highlight the individual uniqueness of every performer on the stage. Um, we thought we were going to sort of delve into some deep and kind of lofty political issues that were relevant to queer youth at this time, but we kind of found that um, the most exciting and engaging and interesting thing about it was just them. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was just putting them on the stage, putting all their beautiful, wild queerness on stage and, and having them negotiate the, that performance uh, honesty. energy, honesty mm -hmm. together. And, um, and we felt like uh, basically we learned a lot from that experience that, um, that it's humanity itself that's, that's really the interesting thing that mm -hmm. about art making in general. And that's what we're interested in as artists. And uh, it was very affirming um, on many levels. I think we're done. D.B. Boyko is a performer, vocalist, composer, and curator who has initiated and participated in many collaborative projects. She is a sp uh, specialist in experimental vocalization and is known throughout Canada for her practice. Uh, and for the last 20 years, she has been the director curator of new music at the Western Front, one of Canada's most preeminent artist-run centers. D.B., um, you know the job that you were going to give me? The job that you were going to give me, is that job done? I will find out. Okay. <laughs> Howdy. Um, hopefully you were handed out a little package. So while I'm giving uh, some basic introductions, uh, you can take the time to open it up and then you discover that you can't actually eat what's inside there. If not, put up your hand. Hopefully Cindy's got a bag. She's wandering around there. Um, I'm over the moon. I've been part of a project now for four years out of the Roundhouse Community Center. It's part of a larger project called the Arts and Health Project. And I just to thank Jill Weaving, Marie Lopez, and Diana Vanderveen, uh, who, are, uh, who have been my guides, as well as uh, other fellow artists. So the Arts and Health Project um, aims to develop uh, creative artistic practice in a community of elders, people who are dealing with chronic illness um, a, as well as isolation. And so the project that I've been working on is called Express Your Voice. And it's a choir and it's an ongoing project which we create works together. And so um, 
I, I admittedly, I, I was a little snubbed that I was um, not able to actually provide sound. So I thought we would actually create our own sound and have our own sense of experience with this. So we're going to do a very uh, basic deep listening exercise. And this is, comes out of the work of Pauline Oliveros, uh, a woman out of the, the 1960s who was really at the vanguard of contemporary music practice and building in ideologies around Buddhism and thoughtfulness and meditation. Um, it's also the 100th anniversary of John Cage's birth who also is the forefather of contemporary music practice, and uh, a lot of these ideas apply. So uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is put these in your ear. You won't be able to hear, um, kind of. And just, we're going to take a moment. I'm giving up a moment of my 10 minutes. Somebody's probably going to get take the hook away from me, I'm sure. Um, and just listen to your own breath. And if you feel the need to make some sound, humming, moving your lips, whatever, and, and uh, let's just do that. Um, I'll turn my watch on. Okay, I started to hear a little bit of sound coming from the room. Hang on to these, they're good for a myriad of uses. Um, so that's a deep listening practice and really that's the basis of uh, a lot of performative uh, development. Uh, it's a way to connect with the breath uh, and the breath is the key aspect to making sound for vocalizing. So I spent a lot of time uh, teaching just the basic principles of that. Um, and it, it really creates a sense of heightened awareness about what is happening in our body. Um, and it also is a great vehicle for doing things like creative vi visualization in, in order to kind of source personal stories. And so I do this on a weekly basis at the Roundhouse Community Center. It, it happens over about eight months. And uh, so I teach them principles like this. I work a lot with improvisation uh, to get them to generate sound and, and create material mm -hmm. for a project that happens uh, annually at the Roundhouse call, uh, uh, called Seniors Week. And uh, the other projects in the Arts and Health um, program um, include um, storytelling, um, um, through theater, through puppetry, uh, there's literary works, visual art, and video storytelling. Um, and of course, we specialize in the voice. Um, so the other thing that I use this exercise for is really a step towards what they were talking about is trust. And trust is really key to uh, helping people engage in something that's new to them. And uh, by just working with that simple idea, they begin to watch themselves and not in a way that they're critical or judgmental about themselves, but they're just watching. And uh, to me, that's one of the most important things um, to, um, to mitigate uncertainty. And uncertainty, I think, is a beautiful thing and really, for me, is the way to connect into art making, what we don't know about. 
and um, and as people are reaching um, um, elderly ages, you know there is a lot of uncertainty. And so what we're trying to do is really engage them in, in a way of moving through the world where they are they can be flexible and they can embrace changes. So this. Um, this whole project has affected my own practice, and it really has come about in my years as a curator and in the past 10 years, really feeling that the community has been very insular. Um, certainly, I mean, I'm in the contemporary music world, but I, I would say at large, and so I have been, you know, in my, my, my own engagements on a curatorial level has been um, to start doing projects with kids and with uh, people just coming out of universities and working with geographers right now. Um, and on my own personal practice is, is to work with vocal choirs and vocal work. Um, so I do have another choir called the Voice Over Mind Choir, which I uh, developed in 2010. And uh, that largely is inviting anybody who wants to come and make crazy sounds with me. So a lot of this also bleeds over and there's a, a lot of interchange with this project that I, I work with out of, out of the Roundhouse. Um, so some of the, the objectives of, of this project of Express Your Voice is to uh, develop a creative practice. It's such a huge subject and it's still a contentious one for me, but grab me in the lobby to talk about that. Um, um, it's about community building and uh, as we move along, it's about integrating with the larger community. So I'm going to give you a few examples about this. So um, in my work at the Western Front, uh, one of my fellow curators brought in Mate Benjanero, who's a Romanian artist, who asked me to do uh, create a work, uh, a choral work, which I worked with my other choir, Voice Over Mind. And um, he was very interested in the Chinese community. And so um, the makeup of the group of Express Your Voice really includes a lot of different people. And we've had uh, simultaneous translation in that group. And so uh, I thought it would be great to feature them in this project. And um, we can see there's Grace Chan and Sylvia Kuang, um, along with Shirley Sung, who's hopefully in another photo here. Um, and we used Mandarin language in a spoken word style to work with chanting. Sylvia actually has a background uh, in Chinese opera, so she uh, was featured as a soloist in this. And uh, it was just fantastic to have them featured and, and stepping across cultural, linguistic boundaries as well as putting them right into uh, the artistic community. Um, so there you can see Shirley, and we're going to talk about her in, in a couple of moments. Um, what has happened, what, the bonus of what, when we started this four years ago, we didn't realize that we were, were going to have to actually deal with translation in the class. And, and it, in the first year, it was a little bit rocky, but it ran smoothly enough. But what, ha what you know, makes me begin to want to weep is that um, the sense of exchange that has happened within the group and uh, some of those who would barely speak a word of English now are communicating with one another, but they're actually really connected and they're affectionate and they're to get up and move across the room and hug one another. And uh, there really is a sense of them um, helping one another. They're really eager to share their own sense of vulnerability and their telling of their stories and of their daily life. Um, and they're really eager to help one another. We have an elderly man, Kurt Gersher, who's 88, who's very fragile. We all adore him, and he's not always completely clued into the picture, but when he comes back a week later, we know he's actually understood what's going on, and these people are helping him out. They're you know, d d sort of reiterating s some of the, the exercises or e explaining things to him. Um, so let's see what else do we have here. So there's Sylvia again. You can see how wonderfully in enthusiastic and, uh, and engaged that she is in, in that performance. Uh, just, um, who's that? Oh, right in behind me, Yvonne actually is a, is a practicing um, actress in the community. So there's a real mix of that. And actually this group has changed, keeps changing its uh, enrollment um, 
but uh, now I, I, I seem to have invited, or they've invited themselves, there are several writers and visual artists who are part of this group. So th it's a, interesting to see how this dynamic will change the, the practice within the group and uh, that, you know, how they help one another. And it, it, it is a two-way gradient. There, is, you know, there are no experts. Here's another project uh, called Zunaqua Beneath the Forest Floor and Through, through the Underworld. And I did this through the Western Front, a 125 project. That's the VPL. And this was kind of a W.C. Fields project to go on the stage with children and animals. Well, we had 150 uh, kids um, from high school bands. And Scott Good, who was the outgoing um, composer in residence, created a piece. We collaborated with William Wasden from Alert Bay. Uh, and his gave us his expertise in, uh, in the storytelling of this myth of a creature from the woods of Zunaqua. I brought William into the seniors class for a session and he, they wouldn't let him go at the end of the, of the class. He was singing them all sorts of traditional and contemporary songs and they were really, really curious about his, um, uh, about his community and about the contemporary Aboriginal community, particularly outside of the city. Um, and so they participated in this project. I had my other choir, uh, Voice Over Mind, and um, they joined in with this. And so I'm, I'm always doing as much as I can to help everybody build their confidence, have that sense of trust that they're going to take those risks. And, the, and But this time, in this context, I was really putting them through the grill to, to really have to deliver. So, you know, the, the, I think some of them had a little bit of anxiousness. But you can see here uh, that they're still smiling <laughs> uh, as part of the rehearsal. So here's some of these gals again. And these, these three have been with me for the past six years, and uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable. I adore them. Um, so uh, the last anecdotal story that I wanted to tell um, in here is a young fellow, uh, gay fellow, Lewis, who uh, came to me through the Western Front, and I asked him to join Voice Over Mind. And here we were in a rehearsal, and uh, following the in event the, the, um, at the VPL, um, I took my other choir, the Express Your Voice Choir, out on a sound walk. So it has some similarities to what our listening was, except you're going outside. And it really is a, a really heightened sense of awareness, and that with their sense of exhilaration of having participated in this, something happened and this pressure valve released and um, two things Shirley uh, talked about her sense of isolation and so she had not opened her mouth to speak a word of English and um, she talked about the fact that she was no longer at home washing dishes. She recognized that she was part of a community. And then she came up with this very poetic line about her experience of the sand walk. And she said, when my foot touches the ground, I feel closer to God. And uh, I, I was short of weeping in that moment. And anyways, we took that, that it became a material of a song uh, for a piece that we performed um, in Seniors Week several months later. And then Lewis became part of the discussion, and uh, we also have a downtown set who's part of um, this uh, Express Your Voice Choir, and some of them are um, not fully retired, and they're, they're very active women and more acculturated and uh, more aware of the artistic and cultural scene. And so yet another confessional happened that they, one of them said you know, she had run into Lewis after one of the rehearsals and had felt uncomfortable about his identity wearing a woman's coat and and uh, and after having a conversation with him realized how remarkable he was and he is a remarkable young artist um, and there was just an avalanche of discussion and Marie Lopez had been telling me all the time you know we're waiting for these conversations to happen and I knew that I had hit the mother load and um, I had really nothing to do with it it was just the accumulation of them learning to be flexible and um, and um, to be open to new ideas. So uh, just one personal note is that, you know, uh, several months before um, Occupy happened, I was having a conversation with a friend going, you know, I just, 
I feel like I, I have nothing to do here and I'm, I feel paralyzed with what's happening in the entire world. And she reminded me that really what this work for me is about my own sense of political activism and working with people and allowing them to transform. And uh, it's, it's just a remarkable process and um, I'm thrilled to be part of it. Thank you. Nicole Dextras is here to speak about the Art is Land Network, a collective that functions as a vital social network for artists engaged in the landscape to share ideas and opportunities and to find common ground for collaboration. Nicole? Hi, my name is Nicole Dextras, and I'm a member of the Art is Land Network, which is a Vancouver-based artist collective whose um, shared connection is the use of natural and repurposed materials to engage with the landscape. Our group acts as an artist think tank to share ideas and opportunities and to find common ground for collaboration and partnerships. Today, I'd like to talk to you about our first project, which was the Art and Land uh, Exhibition which took place here on Granville Island in 2011. The project involved both culture and community on a variety of levels. We created 11 outdoor installations integrated into the landscape of Granville Island, with special attention given to making them accessible to the public. We partnered with uh, local community centers, CMHC, Emily Carr, and the Fringe Festival. Once we decided to produce an exhibition, we looked at the various local sites and community partners and finally decided on the Vancouver Fringe Festival. During um, a meeting with CMHC here on Granville Island, we were told that the Fringe was looking to create a new facet to their festival, which was site-specific theatre. Now, our site-specific art installations turned out to be a great fit for them. Some of our installations overlapped with fringe performances, such as Shirley Weeb's piece, which consisted of two large concrete culverts donated by Ocean Cement here on the island. Uh, the images on the right are from the play situated on the crane, which is that site, by Alley Theatre called Lost in Place. As most fringe shows were in the evening, our installations helped animate the space during the day, which you can see from the images on the left, where the public spontaneously interacted with the art. Also below is uh, Pierre Leichner's piece called Connected, which used colored sand to create a network of line between the trees in Ron Basford Park, which is just over there. Um, that also became part of the site for the tentative equinox play called Rove. The theme of our exhibition was the island as microcosm of our planet's ecosystem. And sorry, there is a mistake. <laughs> it should say microcosm uh, of our planet's ecosystem. Uh, this gave us a broad mandate, though, to interact with the site. For example, my piece was called Stream, and it represented the lost streams of False Creek, and the fact that the island was once a sandbar abundant with sea life. This led, um, well, this idea of the uh, island as being this place full of fish uh, led the local First Nations adopting the saying, when the tide is out, the table is set. Also interpreting the history of Granville Island was Sharon Callis's piece called Dry Dock, relating to the long-standing tradition of boat building and repairing in the area. Sharon worked on site repairing her boat made of willow, alongside the modern boat hulls being scraped and painted at the marina. Other artists, such as Fay Lodgy and Tiki Mohalville, created floating installations that referred to the water. Circumnavigator was a mysterious watercraft nestled under the bridge, which invited curiosity and imaginary voyages. Fay's clam line, which appeared and disappeared around the perimeter of the island, alluded to both the tides and the local fishing industry. Uh, Tiki also had a small piece called Detritus, there were lily pads made from used plastic bowies and fishing paraphernalia. 
it lived up to its name by trapping floating debris in the water, which it turns out there's quite a bit of here on Granville Island. Um, some projects invited the public to engage directly with the works. So, for example, Robin Ripley's piece, uh, they were funnel-shaped forms made of from salal leaves. They encouraged the public to interact uh, with them directly by filling the cups with their own gleanings. Approximately 50 diverse items were deposited, including, including shoelaces, flowers, paper clips, notes, coins, a baby soother, and a snail just to name a few. Um, also, I included the picture of the bug, so it wasn't just people interacting, it was also the plant life and uh, the insect life. <laughs> um, Haruko Kana, um, her ocean flotilla really emphasized the community engagement as it invited the public to partici participate in various stages of her work. Her sculptural work uh, included a boat shape with a figure inside, which also acted as a sundial um, because its shadow pointed to stones that were set in the grass that had text etched into them. Her site also included a drop box where people could write messages of hope, which were later included in hundreds of paper boats launched from the island. So these pictures down here are showing the boats being launched. Uh, this project also included a website where people could submit their messages and track the boats uh, as they traveled around. Uh, which took this project from the local to the international. Our commitment to cultural engagement was also achieved through free public tours, which included facts about the history of the island and also about the intentions of the artists in relation to their work. The Fringe Festival produced a full page in their program with a comprehensive site map of all the exhibits, uh, basic information on each piece, plus a timetable for guided tours. The tour information was also promoted um, online through our website, the Emily Carr website, and of course the Fringes website. The tours were very well attended and we got positive feedback from people who said that the tour enriched their experience. This of course was very important to us because as artists we really did want to engage the public. The other method of public engagement we brought to the project was through workshops. I led workshops at the False Creek Community Center where participants made um, fish out of leaves which were then in incorporated into the stream installation. Uh, Haruko Okano held several workshops to make the hundreds of boats for her um, ocean flotilla launch. The boats were made with 100% chemical free paper and waterproof with eco-friendly kakishibu. In addition to the False Creek Community Center, Haruko partnered with the Britannia and Roundhouse Community Centers, the Means of Production, uh, Community Garden, the China Creek Housing Co-op to host her workshops. So there really was a broad range of people that we engaged in the process of just putting this exhibition together. Promotion. <laughs> well, we had no budget for promotion, so we used our group's artistic talent and our partners' resources to promote the exhibit. Our campaign to engage the community at large consisted in the creation of a map, which was produced by the Fringe, um, on-site signage, web promotion, workshops, press releases, logo design, and invitations. Granville Island lent us some of their posts, which enabled us to have a sign at each site, uh, to which we added bright yellow flags to increase their visibility. As an example, you can see Robin's piece, Samara, which is right beside the picture of the yellow flag there. Uh, a pair of wings covered in maple seeds hanging from one of the well, very few maple trees here on the island. It happened to be located in the busy surround of vendors, and so you can see how the signage was particularly important for pieces such as this. Our intention was to give the public many different ways to discover and interact with the art. The first way was through total serendipity, where island visitors would just stumble across an installation and then maybe read the brief description there and then pick up a map and maybe investigate some of the other ones. The other option was for festival goers to use the guide in the program as a self-guided tour. Or they, from there, they could also just sign up for actual guided tours led by the artists. Uh, the Fringe estimates that about 1,500 people attended the exhibit. funding. <laughs> the, 
The seeds of our project could not have grown without the support of our many funders. Financial support came from the Granville Island Cultural Society, the Vancouver Parks Board, and the Community Arts Council of Vancouver. In addition, we created our own fundraising campaign where individuals and companies could donate directly towards our project. We also had a variety of in-kind support, such as Ocean Cement, the False Creek Community Centre, Granville Island, and the Fringe Festival. Support also came from Emily Carr, which hosted a new institute of classes focusing on art and nature called the um, Second Nature Lab. They also ran an event called Hot House, which we participated in. The success of this project can also be attributed to the many unpaid hours of work from the group itself. Logo, logo design, letterhead development, website, photography, writing, signage, and tours are just some of the talents that we drew upon. The members of the AILN each have active individual practices, both locally and internationally. Our members have participated in art residencies, sculpture parks, and land art festivals. From Mongolia to Mexico, with many stops in between, this global exposure to other projects has inspired us to seek out ways that we can share some of those ideas here in Vancouver. We're interested in pursuing projects that work with the larger community to provide a sense of engagement and a stewardship of the land. This past year, Mop Ark, which is the means of production garden, has been the site for our live lab, an incubator for ideas and the development of new projects in the future. And in the future, we're always interested in possible partners for sites, and of course, we wouldn't say no to funding either. If you're interested in knowing more about the AILN and our activities, please visit our website at artislandnetwork.com. Thanks a lot. Our last 10 by 10 speaker for today is Ivy Fong. Ivy is the business liaison for the DVBIA's 16,000 members, and she is the voice of downtown Vancouver on Twitter and Facebook. She handles many community projects, including public Wi-Fi, wayfinding, uh, street food, and public art. So welcome, Ivy. Okay. Um, hi. So just really quickly, I just want to get a sense of um, who knows what a business improvement association is. Wow, that's pretty good actually. That's good to see. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the RAP project, which is an initiative between the Downtown Vancouver BIA and Emily Carr. Um, essentially, graffiti has been an issue for our downtowns all over North America, the world over. Um, since cavemen have been drawing on cave walls um, thousands and thousands of years ago, graffiti has been an issue. Um, some call graffiti the voice of the urban underprivileged, some call it art, and some call it vandalism. So needless to say, graffiti and graffiti art has both fascinated and frustrated uh, downtown associations, and it's cost us millions of dollars. Um, from city-run abatement programs to programs run by BIAs. Uh, at the downtown Vancouver BIA, we're no different. Um, like you, we're a nonprofit. We have challenges with budget. Um, we have a downtown ambassador program. What they do is they report the graffiti to the city, and sometimes the city has an anti-graffiti unit that can deal with these issues, and sometimes it's cut from the budget. So either way, unaddressed graffiti often leads to more graffiti, which leads to vandalism, which leads to decay. Um, Granville Street in downtown Vancouver over the years is a great case in point. Uh, Granville has seen its heyday as a great white way back in the days of neon. Um, since then, decay, dirt, crime, a bad reputation, even some porn shops. Um, over the last 30 years, graffiti has played a big part of this blight. Um, in 2006, um, we began construction for the Candle Line, um, in part for the Olympics. And while the construction was in place, um, there was a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. The city had invested $21 million in the redesign of the street, and this was finally our chance to get Granville Street right, to um, make it what we want it to be. 
Um, I had the unique opportunity to have that as part of my bucket. We only have seven people in our organization. BIAs tend to have very small staffs, and while we have a lot of members that we, we represent, um, we only have seven people, and I happen to have Granville Street fall on my lap. So day in, day out, I would visit the businesses and um, let them yell at me, which was great fun. Um, but in that, we also had opportunities to hear what people wanted to see on the street. So one of the things that we did is we struck a, a membership committee, which allowed people to provide input on the design of the street. So it was designed, uh, it was to include clean lines, a blue-gray monochrome palette, and we saw during the Olympics that Granville Street was really wildly popular. Um, we, it's what we call center ice. Um, it was fun, it was busy, we had a, a ton of buskers. Um, if you remember as well, during that time, we also sponsored Lunar Festival for the first time, and they installed lanterns on the 700 block of Granville Street. The city had just um, established that area as plaza space where organizations could host festivals, and we were just kind of feeling out how that might look. Um, what you might not know is while they installed these white neon tubes throughout the entire street on the 700 block, it was a little bit different. The sidewalks were wider. Um, the street sides were wider, and then the neon tubes were twice as big. Um, after a year, after the Olympics, um, we began to realize that the monochrome palette was kind of boring, really, really flat. And um, we had these electrical boxes, gray electrical boxes, up and down the street that had recently been installed. Um, but they didn't really add much to the vibrancy of the street and in fact um, attracted quite a bit of attention from graffiti artists or people that wanted to poster their posters. Um, it was a bit of a challenge, but um, these we were approached by um, members of the community, our business members, just saying, what can we do? What can we do to make our boxes look a little bit more interesting and hopefully deter some of the graffiti? So what happened was um, I was faced with this issue and I was just surfing on Google because that's what I do sometimes and I happened to notice that Cameron Carte was um, presenting on public art and so I quickly shot her an email and said, hey, we've got a problem. Do you want to talk about maybe doing a public art project for downtown Vancouver? And she shot it back saying, yes, we'd love to do that. And we thought that was fantastic. We arranged to have a meeting together and um, we decided to have a student business collaboration, which is something that we've never really done before. Um, what we did is we offered the opportunity for students and graduate students to submit designs um, for the different boxes. Um, and our, our primary purposes were to celebrate the creativity of our students, to provide an opportunity for these newly trained artists to be exhibited, to help, help Emily Carr sort of establish a foothold in our air, which we wanted to emphasize further, um, highlight the character of each city block along Granville Street, help deter graffiti and postering, and most of all, add color to our gray and blue street. Um, so what we did was we organized walking tours with the students where we take them in small groups and we talk about the different nature of each block. Like if you're familiar in Granville Street downtown, pretty much from the 700 block, um, it's different. The south side is more entertainment based, whereas the north side is more financial. So we basically went through the challenges that happen in each block, the traffic flow, the different businesses, um, the kind of objectives that they were trying to achieve in each block, and the students were to design something that reflected their passion, their flavor, and also the local flavor of that specific area. In the end, um, we ended up striking a judging panel, faculty from Emily Carr, members of the business community, and an environmental design security consultant and we had about 150 designs that we reviewed. The results, beautiful, just stunning. We were so pleased with what um, came out of it. Um, for example, um, if you can see right there, that's the one that's right in front of H&M, I believe. So it's a block that tends to have a lot of clothing, and if you can't tell, it's a closet. And then down there, um, that's the box that was in front of Tom Lee Music, um, and that's speakers, but what you can't tell is actually a whale on it. It was called Whale Sounds 2, and it was sort of a tribute to music. So all of them, very interesting, very beautiful. Um, together, we had 11 blocks, one to two on each block, and they can be toured right from the 300 block of Granville right to the 1200 block of Granville. 
um, on each of these boxes is a QR code that can be scanned. And with that, they could find out more information about the program, more information about the artist, and it also enabled us to provide some metrics. So we could tell when people were taking the tour, which boxes they were hitting, which ones were more popular. Um, something valuable, I think, in doing these kinds of projects. Uh, here's a picture of the students and Susan. <laughs> um, to launch the project, we had a media event at Tom Lee Music. It was so rewarding to see how excited the students were. Some invited their grandparents and their parents. Uh, they felt like they had arrived. It was pretty amazing and it felt great to be a part of that. Um, they would see a real tangible location where their art would be exhibited. And ultimately, you know, this project wasn't that much. It was $20,000 for the full installation and maintenance for a year and a half. Um, we provided a partnership fee and faculty honorariums. The students were also given honorariums. Um, ultimately, we were responsible for the production, the production costs, and Emily Carr helped with the design and the, the judging and organization. And the city of Vancouver, when we did this project, it was right about um, Thanksgiving, um, the, the, their staff, their engineers, actually stepped away from their Thanksgiving dinners to approve the plethora of designs that we had. So they provide in-kind advice, approvals, um, and also gave us permission to put these wraps on the electrical boxes. So um, just in terms of measurables, um, you, the electrical boxes would have about uh, a tagging once every week, several perhaps every week, but now it happens very, very rarely. There seems to be a real respect of the work by other artists. The project has then um, since forged a new relationship between business and arts, which we're very pleased with. Um, we're happy to add to our inventory of public art. Emily Carr students were super excited to showcase their work and the u university provided real world learning opportunities. So a win, win, win. Super excited about that. Um, the DVBIA also furthered its partnership with the city, always a plus. We engaged the staff in the process and provided streetscape enhancements at no cost to the city. They love that. Um, in addition to that, we had we used special eco-friendly vinyl to wrap the boxes, doing our bit for the green cause. Um, and in terms of the business benefit, um, this project uh, addressed two strategic objectives for the BIA. Um, make, in helping the downtown feel safe and clean and adding to our streetscape and redesign. So while we haven't totally eliminated graffiti, we, ha we have made a dent um, in terms of savings as well. Um, many BIAs have since have heard about this project and they're super keen on replicating it. We've won three awards uh, with the International Downtown Association, um, with the CSA and the BIABC, and we're looking forward to continuing a future project with Emily Carr. Thank you. Thanks, my name is David Pei, and I'm here to introduce the witnesses who will take information and their own observations from each of the breakout sessions and relate them back to you. The four witnesses today are Simon Levin, Claire Robson, Terry Hunter, and Kamala Todd. And we're actually going to start uh, at the bottom of the list in your program with Kamala Todd, who was born and raised in the Coast Salish territory of Vancouver. She is Cree, Irish, and German, and she has a master's degree in urban geography from the University of British Columbia. Her work as a community planner, filmmaker, and writer is focused on facilitating and making space for Aboriginal stories and perspectives. She is creator of such projects as Storyscapes and Indigenous City. Her film credits, in, credits include Sharing Our Stories, the Vancouver Dialogues Project, Indigenous Plant Diva, and Cedar and Bamboo. She also worked as a writer and director on the children's Cree language series, Nahiyawetan, and most recently, Kamala worked as a consultant and facilitator with the City of Vancouver Dialogues Project. She lives with her husband and two young sons in New Westminster, Kamala Todd. Thank you. So I don't have the 10 slide limit, so I can just take all the time I need, right? There's so, okay, okay. There's so much to reflect upon, and I know that I'm supposed to reflect upon the breakout session, and I will. 
but the previous um, presentation just gave me so much to respond to that I'd like to take that opportunity in my kind of overall um, reflections on the day, if I could. I happened to do my master's thesis on the redevelopment of Granville Street, actually, the area that you're referring to. Um, so I think it's really interesting and I want to talk a little bit about the language of erasure and the and sort of neo, neo-colonial um, waves that projects like this that are seemingly win-win, all good for the artists, um, have consequences. So in my own research of Granville Street and Granville Mall, Granville Mall was not a wasteland. It was not empty. It was not just dirty and covered in graffiti. There were many SRO hotels there that were home to many low-income people who couldn't find homes anywhere else. It was a place that had been, um, well, a, a welcoming place for hippies, and then it became a welcoming place for street kids and punks. My friends and I used to hang out there. And um, it, it was a community. It was a place. It had stories and narratives and meaning. Um, but the DVBIA and other organizations like that, um, you know, the language of who are the wanted publics, who are the desirable publics, who belongs and doesn't belong. So if you're trying to reclaim that place and restore it to the great white way, as it used to be called, then suddenly you need, you need to rewrite the story so that street kids are no longer in place there. They become out of place. So I did a lot of research on the narratives of that, and I think it um, relates very well to some of the things that came up for me when we are talking about social practice. Um, I'm, I work mostly in film, but I also work a lot in pub thinking about public art and the importance and the privilege of, of, of seeing ourselves reflected in the landscape, of being able to write ourselves onto the land, of seeing our language, our aesthetics, our stories, um, our history, our contributions, all of those things reflected in the urban landscape. As a geographer, I spend a lot of time reading the environment around me. And I think we could all agree that not everybody's story is visible. Not all of us are acknowledged as being part of that. And so I think um, these projects are wonderful because everybody wants to have a visible presence. Everybody wants to um, have the opportunity to express themselves. But we do need to ask, you know, who is considered um, a legitimate artist? Who is considered, what is considered legitimate expression? Um, so when young people try to write themselves onto the landscape, try to be visible, is their stuff, their expression, any less valid than the more um, official stuff? Is the question I ask to you. Um, so, uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm not trying to poo-poo what you did. I just went, because of all the research and the work that I did there, I see a lot of this kind of... Um, it's the same thing we see in the downtown east side, right? The whole reclaiming of that wasteland, that kind of language. Um, in our workshop, it was a wonderful discussion um, in our breakout session. Um, a lot of the things that people were looking at in terms of supporting artists to do this kind of work was, you know, the usual frustrations around resources and access and the amount of time people have to spend um, on the administrative work and the burnout that happens and all of those things that I think we're all very familiar with, um, you know, they're just, the reality is they affect people's work, they affect the projects that we can and can't do. So those things came up a lot in our discussion about supporting this kind of work. Um, There's also a lot of discussion about instead of always focusing on money and finances and grants, is what are other ways that we can support each other? So the whole idea of mentorships and you know, also getting support through access and space, um, people sharing their expertise, people helping you connect to those networks that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. So other ways of supporting and creating that work other than just funding. Um, you know, the whole issue of one really important and poignant question that was asked was, yes, it's important to support artists to do this community engagement kind of work, but the first question is, um, why should community support artists to do that in the first place? So not assuming that, that that's just a given, that you can just go in and, and do that work. So that raised questions around, how do you connect with community? How do you make them see that um, the work that you want to do as part of that community or as an artist who has some kind of connection to that community 
that that work can actually help them and, and revitalize the area or whatever the various objectives of that community are. Um, and that raised questions around, you know, should you be from within that community? Is it okay for artists from other places to come in and do that kind of work? But definitely not taking for granted that an artist can just go in and say, I want to do this. And then the other really interesting idea was raised around the language of that. You know, the language of, well, we're going to help you or we're going to fix your neighborhood or, um, you know, we want to um, revitalize or whatever. And, and some of the power imbalances that can come out of that kind of language. And so that raised all kinds of wonderful discussion around engagement and working together and that kind of stuff. Um, so not that I can actually represent everything that was talked about. Um, there were many different examples, and if people want me to share some of those examples, I can. I know for myself what came up again a lot of was about place and voice and again, who, who has a voice, who is considered a legitimate artist, and how much are artists um, coming in and maybe taking people's stories as content for their project, as opposed to working with community. Um, you know, lots of time it's, it is completely, you know, people are working together and shaping the project together, but let's be honest, there is a history of coming in and kind of mining people's stories and cultures and that kind of thing. Um, I like th that it was also raised, you know, the whole idea of there are diverse communities. So when we say engaging with the community, well, who is that community? There are many communities, and the work is, is the onus is on us um, who go in there to try to create these projects to, to really identify and, and work with all of the various groups, you know, as, as well as we can. Um, you know, and if there is resistance from within a community, it's usually because of some of the history, uh, maybe some uncertainty or mistrust people might have. And that's why working with people to shape the project idea is always much more successful um, than coming in with an already predetermined project. Does anybody from the group want to make sure that I don't omit certain things or that I highlight things that I haven't highlighted? I have my own agenda, so I'm kind of <laughs> <laughs> scribbling all my own comments. Um, or does anybody who wasn't in that group Interested in some examples? Well, I can speak for either the my own work with the street-involved youth in that area and then my own work with Aboriginal people and the whole idea that um, there's sort of a dominant narrative to most neighborhoods or to most communities in our city, right? So you have Yale Town has a certain identity, Granville Street has a certain identity, but that dominant narrative, you know, erases a lot. So my whole approach through that Storyscapes project was, okay, so Gastown is seen as the history, the birthplace of Vancouver, but where are the Coast Salish people in that story? So we did what we could with a small project timeline to try and gather some of those stories and work with people to share their stories of that area and their understanding of, of that area and their relationship with it. With the Street Involved Youth, I didn't feel comfortable going out and interviewing people, but what I did, they had a, a really cool zine at the time. I don't remember what it's called from downtown, I forget the name at the moment. Um, so they had a really cool zine that was that based out of the downtown south area, and it was full of their narratives of their place and how they felt about Vancouver. Nothing you would ever really encounter in your everyday experience of that place, but those voices were there. So I think a lot of it is, um, you know, again, not this idea that the marginalized people can become your content, but that you recognize the legitimacy of their voices and you find ways to support everybody to try and express their place and even their dis dissatisfaction with what's going on in their community um, and that, that the dominant narrative doesn't reflect their place there. And so just one last point, um, and I'm happy to talk more about it after, but um, in terms of the Aboriginal community, I mean, in all of our work in the city, you can't disconnect. We're all part of the land and we should be, be very aware where we are on the land and, and develop those connections and help all of us develop those connections because I think when you're in the city, people forget 
that we're on an ecosystem, that we're on land, that we're on indigenous land. And so the more we connect to those stories and connect and build relationships with the people of this place and the land, then all of our practice will hopefully um, be rich with that actual, those stories, so that the erasures and the kind of invisibility will no longer be as blatant as it currently is. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Kamala. Terry Hunter was the witness in session number three, and he is the co-founder and executive director of Vancouver Moving Theater, an award-winning community-engaged arts organization based in the downtown east side. Recipient of the City of Vancouver Mayor's Award for Community Art and the British Columbia Community Achievement Award for his work with and for the residents of the downtown east side, Terry is also the artistic producer of the groundbreaking and flagsh flagship Downtown East Side Heart of the City Festival, Terry Hunter. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, David. Um, and thank you to the uh, organizers for inviting me to, he to be here today. I'm actually stepping in for Savannah Walling, um, who was initially invited to, um, to take on this role, but she wasn't able to be here today. So I was lucky enough to, um, to um, get the job. Um, the session that we had was on how organizations, institutions, businesses engage the arts, what constitutes success and failure, and what are the values of explicit and intangible outcomes. Um, I hope that I can <laughs> grasp the breadth of what was said in the very interesting conversation um, with a very, very interesting group of people who had lots of really, really interesting things to say and certainly stimulated a lot of um, creative thoughts for me, questions, and, um, and, and thoughts about my own perspective. Um, so I'm going to give uh, a quick overview of what was discussed, and um, that'll include some of the interesting quotes that I, that I heard and wrote down. And um, along the way, I may give my comments and I'm also circle back and try to give some of my own particular perspectives and thoughts. Um, some questions are asked that um, I certainly was asking myself 10 years ago and, um, and have come up with certainly what's been um, uh, some solutions or approaches for my company, Vancouver Moving Theater Company. Um, and if you could, David, just give me, yeah. So um, the conversation that we had, the questions that were asked were really springboards. And uh, we kind of bounced on them and moved around um, in the circle. Um, touching back on them and then moving around again. And um, so the, the, while the question served as a, as, you know, as, a t as a touchstone and a springboard, we certainly didn't address each one individually. Um, we talked about um, measurability and the whole notion of evaluation and how do we measure our outcomes, that god-awful language that probably comes from the corporate world. Um, and then the conversation also rolled into um, a discussion around sustainability. And it, this ties into you know, comments like, we have to uh, write these grants, and we're forced to do these kind of questionnaires, and it's hard to get money because we don't know how to answer the questions. And um, which tied into a larger question around sustainability, and how do we, how do we uh, continue on and survive in the face of of changing times, and in particular in the face of, um, of funding decreases. Um, the conversation then rolled into um, um, uh, comments around uh, art and the creating of art, and particularly around the process. And one of the, the comments that someone made is, um, process is the priority. And this is in relationship to um, community art. And that Community art is best developed when the community develops and uh, the ideas and the methodology, which I found really interesting because um, I come at it from quite a different perspective. Um, I realized too, 
Oh, I'll finish my thought and then I'll come back because I just realized I forgot to say one thing I wanted to say. Which the next area we talked about a discussion of what community art practice is in itself. And um, one of the interesting comments was um, the reality is we are all working in community, um, which I find a, a very, very um, interesting comment. Um, and I'll come back and I'll talk about that. Um, and then at the end, um, somebody mentioned, in fact, it was Carrie Nimmo, talked about um, the importance of responsibility, and um, which I found really interesting because to me, responsibility is one of the key elements of this, this practice that we call community-engaged practice. And, and which also went into the notion of remaining relevant and um, the idea, quote, of taking art to the people, which again, I also found very, very interesting comment. And then the whole notion about accountability, sorry, about um, outcomes and measurement. There was a lot of discussion at the end about the importance of documentation. And um, what is the documentation that we need to do? And um, to me, that's really, really key. And I'm going to come back and talk about that. And then the last part, which was really, really interesting, was a conversation around what constitutes failure, which I thought was a really, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, failure in the context of community art practice. And um, the thing I wanted to say at the top, I come from my own particular bias. Um, my bias is I come to this work as a professional artist, as a professional community engaged artist. And my particular take on community art practice is that it is artists working with and for community in a collaborative and shared experience to create art. That's what my, that's my bias. So when I look, when I'm talking about community art practice, that's what I'm talking about. And that's my particular bias and I'm pretty clear about what that is. And um, the other element too is I think in terms of terminology, we get mixed up between the notion of community art and the notion of community art practice. Um, we produce, Vancouver Movement Theatre produces the Downtown Eastside Heart of the City Festival. And we had this conversation very, very early on. Is this community art practice, the festival? And the, the conclusion we came to, it's not community art practice, but it is supporting community in the making of art. So a lot of times when we talk about community art, we're talking about the art that comes out of a community. That might be people going and taking a, uh, a class, that might be an art program, and might be all kinds of things. But it's very distinct from the notion of community art practice, which is artists working with and for community to create art that gives voice to that particular community, but also supports the art of the artist. Those are two very, very different things. And I think that in our conversations, we often mix those two things up. Um, how much time do I have? Three minutes. Okay, so here we go. Um, measurability, I want to talk about that. How do we evaluate? And somebody said, f feeling like we're forced into evaluation. I, th I think from my perspective, it's a very, um, it's not a good attitude, um, if I can put it that way. Um, it's very, very important as artists that we always evaluate our own work. And we need to do that whether we're involved as a community artist or a community engaged artist or as just as an artist. And so it's very important for the art practice of community art that we evaluate what we're doing and it's very very important that that evaluation is built into the process and that evaluation is built into the process at the beginning of the project and so one of the questions that came up with that came up in the room was well how do you evaluate and one of the ways that we evaluate um, by we I mean Vancouver Moving Theatre and the Heart of the City Festival is that we develop both quantitative and qualitative um, measurements. And quantitative is very simple, straightforward things like how many people came to the event, how many participants were in the event, um, um, what else, let's see, I'll look at my notes here. Um, how, many hits, how many hits in the media did we get? These are very quantifiable things that you can identify very, very early on to develop your measurements. The other area that we do is qualitative. And they can be simple as simple as and as profound as the participants enjoy the process. 
That's very, very important to us. If people don't enjoy the process, then I question whether you've had a successful project. And, and that has to do with the, the essence of what community art practice is about, it, which is the artist working with the community and the people having a good experience. And being able to go away from that and say, I really want to do that again. Oh boy, I really got to one minute left. So anyways, um, we called this um, indicators of success. And we actually got it from Jill Weaving. Um, Jill Weaving has been a rock for us. Um, she provided us with this foundation, and it's been really, really helpful for us in the early years. Um, sustainability. Uh, there was co conversations around sustainability. And I want to, um, for me, the essence of art community art practice is artists engaging with community and developing that relationship and developing the sustainability of that relationship. That's crucial. And that has been crucial, I think, to the success of something like the Heart of the City Festival because we've been able to develop um, relationships with over 40 organizations within the downtown east side. And those relationships are very, 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 very important to us. And we do a lot of work to develop that sustainability. And the key thing about art is that despite the fact that there's going to be cutbacks and despite the fact that we're going to go through hard times, we can develop the flexibility and the adaptability to be able to work with community so that the art that comes out of the community is always flowing. Human beings are, by their very nature, have the impulse to create art. It's going to be there. It's been there since the time immemorial, and it'll be there if the BC Arts Council ever goes away. <laughs> we will continue to make art. So our role as artists is to keep supporting that and keep developing that. And my role um, as an artist is not only to support my own practice, but also to work with the community to develop their practice. And um, I'm not going to get through nearly all of this stuff, but I do want to go back to that notion of responsibility. Um, because to me that is really, really key. Um, one of the key elements of, of, for myself of artistic practice is the responsibility to work with the community from the beginning, through the process, to the end. And that includes evaluation. What did the community, how did the community re respond? Um, I heard somebody the other day say, um, we went into community and we took their stories. And this was a gentleman that was very, very interested in community art practice, but I thought, boy, there's a step that he's missing here. Um, you don't go into community and take stories. You go into community and you work with them in the supporting of them, of telling their own stories. And that's a huge responsibility. It's also a huge responsibility to maintain your own integrity as an artist and to find that meeting place between your art and the voice of the community so that that shared collaborative experience is a positive one for not only you as an artist, but um, for the community itself. And I'll end there. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Claire Robson was the witness for group number two. Oh, thanks. Did that come back? Ooh, password time. Uh, Claire Robson is writer in residence for Quirky, the queer imaging and writing collective for elders, an arts engaged group of elder activists funded by Canada Council and BC Council for the Arts. She's also a contract researcher for the University of Calgary. Her research theorizes the educational potential of writing memoir, the subject of her new book, Writing for Change, which is published by Peter Lang Press. Claire was the 2007 Pink Triangle Pr Press Writer of the Year and the 2009 recipient of the Lynch History Prize. At UBC, she received the Joseph Katz Memorial Scholarship and the Dean's Award, among others. And her creative work has appeared in the North American Review, So to Speak, and many other journals, newspapers, and anthologies. And she has a number of publications in scholarly journals. Her memoir, Love and Good Time, was published by Michigan State University Press and her edited collection of stories, Outside Rules, by Per Se Books. Claire Robson. Thank you. So uh, I'm a memoirist and a fiction writer, so take everything I say with a grain of salt, please. Uh, also, I pay attention as a writer to strange things like uh, sayings, imagery, 
and uh, just sort of the weird little uh, peripheral sidebars that come up in the conversation, so watch out for that. Uh, we did have a question, but it boiled down really to three words, and they were audience, participation, and engagement. And we had a navigating image uh, or, or phrase, I think, that emerged through our discussion, and it was a sort of reversal of um, if we build it, they will come. We were rather asking, if we build it, will they come? Uh, the image that became a sort of reference point for the dialogue was the purple alley from Barbara and Susan's presentation. This was referred to quite again, uh, again and again. It was kind of a touchstone. And people framed this really as a safe place to take risks and as an ignored urban space that was ready to be transformed. Uh, that became a revised space, that revised our own notions of how much space we might need to make art and to engage in art and what kind of space uh, that might be. So what was our space? We were in a public space, Emily Carr. Uh, we were in a room with tables. We each had a very large piece of blank paper in front of us. And I saw this as a symbolic reminder of how frightening it, it can be to engage in art. I know my blank piece of paper loomed, and I, I watched what other people did with theirs. Some people wrote very small in the corners. Other people filled it with... Some people did not engage at all with their large piece of paper. We all had um, working vocal cords, and we could all speak English, and that may seem a minor point, but of course it's not. Some of us wrote, and some of us spoke, and some of us did not. Art requires constraints and structure. We talked about this quite a lot, and Marie Lopez was very helpful in providing us with some constraints for our conversation. We were to turn off our cell phones, and we were not to discuss the contested nature of funding. <laughs> Nobody's cell phone went off, but we completely ignored the second constraint. <laughs> and in fact, from the get-go, we began to talk about funding, but because Marie had told us not to, <laughs> and because we were artists, we did it in a very subversive, <laughs> tangential way. Behind all our conversations, I felt lurked the forbidden topic of funding <laughs> and management and its contrast with art. So over lunch, I pulled out these uh, contrasts on the one hand, there is professionalism, policy, management, accountability, funding, bureaucracy. This is separated into departments that do not communicate with each other. <laughs> As Judy said, and here's a snatch of dialogue, welcome to the nightmare. <laughs> this bureaucracy is large, unwieldy, and monolithic and it quantifies engagement through counting. On the other hand, we have art. Art occurs in a small, intimate space. The body becomes the instrument. Art is nimble. Art is creative, playful, childish. It kicks out received wisdom, and it kicks against the departments that are created by bureaucrats. It's passionate, it's educational, it's energetic, and it's engaging. So throughout our conversations, we played for a while with these dichotomies. We talked about evidence of engagement, for example. Do you count the number of people who come to an art show, or do you try somehow to assess their relationship with the, with the art, with the quality of their engagement? 
We talked about freedom, about boundary crossing, and about structure on the other hand. We talked about the notion of, uh, the outworn notion we felt of the artist as individual, uh, lost soul wandering in the wilderness, and art as collaboration, art as social activism. We talked about being active and about being passive. We talked about process rather than product. We talked for a while about the, um, some of us thought, false dichotomy between, on the one hand, the artist who is dangerous, disturbing, and unpredictable, and on the other hand, uh, the fact that art can be safe, it can be healing, it can be sweet, it can be innocent. It can even, um, as I think our last uh, witness pointed out, a sign of gentrification, something uh, to be suspected. There is large, there is unwieldy, there is faceless, there is small, there is intimate, and there is nimble. Uh, Judy gave us the image of the goldfish in a bowl for the artist. And we began in the uh, latter third of our time to consider how the goldfish might get out of the bowl, how the goldfish might invite people in or send messages out to the um, wider universe in order to engage. And we talked about how the gap might be bridged. Um, Mark talked about some of the people he worked with as a musician in Richmond who came up to him uh, passionate to make music, but feeling somewhere that art was out there or perhaps in there in the bowl. He said the way they talked to me about wanting to make music made me feel like they wanted to engage in pornography. <laughs> there was an element of the illicit, uh, of the passionately dreamed of, but barely understood. And one of my favorite take home points was um, when Marie responded to Mark by saying that what we need to do then is to crack open the everyday life of art. How can we uh, bear the soul of art? How can we make comprehensible what are often seen as esoteric and rarefied processes, even dangerous um, processes? Murray uh, from Gallery Gachet talked about getting work out of the garret and onto the wall. But people felt that wasn't quite enough, that um, also we needed to find translators in the gallery as people looked at the work, that somehow art may have taken something of a wrong turn as it got lost in art speak. How do we find translators for the work at exhibitions? How do we help people navigate the bewildering array of art that's available? Somebody said the problem is not that there's not enough art, there's too much bloody art. Nobody knows which thing to go to anymore. <laughs> How do we navigate that? How do we help people make those decisions? How do we make art that matters? How do we bring art to public spaces like prisons? How do we bring music to people in a petting zoo kind of way. I love that. Um, some of the solutions make art for social justice, lose the art speak, tell people, somebody said, somebody tell me do what, what, what to do when I get home after they finished an art project. Tell people what to do when they get home. Include everyone in a tightly woven fabric that's inclusive and accessible. And I want to leave you with a mystery because I feel every uh, piece of art, every performance should end in, in a, an opening and a mystery. So here's a mystery that I'm trying to unravel um, in, in what uh, one person, I think it was Judy, said. She said, before there is an engagement, there must be a proposal. 
and a proposal means getting down on one knee. It's a risky offer. Not every engagement ends in a marriage. We have to be able to say no. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Claire. The final witness is Simon Levin, who is a sessional lecturer within Critical and Cultural Studies and Dynamic Media here at Emily Carr University. And he has published a curriculum on contemporary public art and pedagogical insights on practice-based research. He creates site-based site systems that explore the aesthetics and engagements, engage, pardon me. Simon creates site-based systems that explore the aesthetics of engagement using a variety of designed forms and tools that address our many publics. These spatial and pedagogical projects expand the social agency of art making, rethinking notions of space and place, authorship and audience. Working collaboratively and primarily within the public sphere, Simon's work ranges from billboard projects, alternative tours of cities, land care centers, and alternative mapping and telecommunication systems. Recently commissioned projects include a user-generated gener surveillance system and a global contributive new media platform, both showcased for Vancouver's 2010 Cultural Olympiad. He has been artist in residence for the Vancouver Parks Board, the Tech Lab at the Surrey Art Gallery, and at the International Art Space in Calaveran, Australia. He's exhibited, lectured, and published both locally, nationally, and internationally. Simon Levin. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Thank you for ev everyone who's here. Uh, that's a really tough <laughs> act to follow, Claire. <laughs> I don't have the poetic uh, resonance that you have. Uh, but I will do my best. And I realized that I was struck with a task, a challenge, it goes completely against my nature. I was challenged to be a witness, which meant that you had to repeat, potentially verbatim, what people say. And as my partner knows, I don't hear that way. I don't, <laughs> I don't know the words that came out. And so I'm struck there, kind of imagining that I'll I'll, I'll write down a few little words and, and, and then I would get hit with an image and then I would just sit and look at that image, and then realize a few sentences went by and I still hadn't written anything down. And so as I took the time to try to gather my notes, I realized these are useless. <laughs> these are useless. And it speaks to, in fact, what I do best, is I work from uncertainty as it's been spoken about before, this idea that I am not an expert on anything. I am not somebody who's got great crafts or great skills. I am not anything that I can truly tell my students, do it the way I did it. And that actually helped me understand that that was the way that everyone is sort of talking about. That this exchange of knowledge that everyone is trying to put forth is m there's a variety of practices. There's a variety of methodologies that are being used here. And that all of them will work or not work. But it is actually in that engagement that makes them useful. Um, my own role within a lot of these types of um, gatherings is I always see myself as the person who wants to problematize the notion of community. I don't buy it. I know a lot of you people do. <laughs> I know it. I love the, that you do. But I also think that it is, I once had a, a, a mentor, uh, Stephen Kurtz from Critical Art Ensemble, who said, you know, community is to the left like family values is to the right. <laughs> that in some ways that we all go to community and believe that in fact, we all have to believe in this together. And ultimately, there's these moments where dissent and conflict don't always connect. And so that's how I come to this. I come to this as an educator who is always interested in those ruptures, those dissonances, because I feel that is where they can grow. And to pull from the session, the session also spoke 
to me in certain ways, and they're images that I grappled at. Um, one of the things that was talked about was this notion of cross-silo collaboration. The idea that Emily Carr has a program, SFU has a program, Langara has a program, <laughs> that everyone's got the program and they're all, in many essence, as all institutions do, in competition. But how do you facilitate that crack? Uh, I think it was Elizabeth who used the term leaky. How does it leak out? And how, you know, borrowing from uh, one of the grad students that I worked with recently, the Leonard Cohen so song about cracks are what the le lets the light flow in. That ultimately that this, these cracks are also areas in which we can plant seeds and see where they grow. That in some ways that in this session, people were wondering at what point are the students um, are the students at the right place to actually get the benefit of learning some of the skills? And it became probably a moment of agreement with most of them that it should start at any time. That perhaps it is actually useful to be done at uh, middle schools. That the idea of trying to figure out how to build that toolbox, that kit that they walk out of school with and that they now have the confidence to be able to work in these ways. How, what does, what do, how do we get there? So one of the key things that I looked at and I thought, okay, well, if I start with that toolbox, I can start to break it down because I can picture the toolbox. I can see the toolbox. So what's in that toolbox? In that toolbox, there's one problem. That problem is time. Social practice takes time. It doesn't fit into a semester system. It does not fit into three credits or six credits. It takes time. It takes time in which the process is a protracted way of working in which skills are grown into and learned into, not just absorbed and then uh, regurgitated. We are all moving towards an educational system that tries to resist that kind of point in which there is an elite authority in the room, that we're opening up our learning, and we're trying to figure out ways that those, those types of um, unpacking of education itself can be a, a way of facilitating. In that toolbox, there is obviously a best practices, right? How do we demonstrate best practices? And I think in some ways what we have uh, today is an example of different practices. Some people will look at those and say, you know what, that one was definitely a best practice. Other people will look at it, certain projects and go, I don't get it. How are they allowed to do that? That's ridiculous. That's, that's, there was no community involvement at all. I don't know. Those are the types of things that we need to understand is what is our criteria for best practices. Uh, as Terry said just before me, he's very clear on what a best practice is, and that is what guides his work. If a student can find that best practice that, that fits with their project, then they have a guiding force, a guiding path. Um, also, this notion that it has to be socially sustainable. I think it was Susan Stewart who brought up this point, that the so social sustainability is part of understanding that they're not going to get it in one course. They're not going to get it in one way of working. That it has to be something that in the act of engaging with the practice, other things start to uh, be attracted to it. That it actually supports the actual community of practitioners. That the people who are engaged and see themselves as part of these practitioners are also involved in there so that they are bringing and working with people from their projects and bringing them into educational facilities. Then those educational facilities are producing more young people who are interested in getting back into those groups. That there is to, has to be an ethics. There has to be an ethics of representation, an ethics 
of social interaction, and ethics in terms of, um, I think it was Terry who was talking about responsibility. It has to be um, the idea of respect, that ultimately that we are engaged in a way to understanding that this isn't um, the plucking of content, that, that, that at the end when the person sees their content used in a way that does not fit with their understanding of how it was going to be used, there is some betrayal. In this toolbox, there has to be some entrepreneurship. There has to be this understanding that students come out of these programs, and even though we might have courses called professional practice, how do they actually learn where to go look for a grant? Where do they actually get the skills to learn how to fundraise, to partner? I mean, if one of the things that we're talking about cross-silo collaboration is to partner with other groups, where do we learn to partner? It isn't so advantageous for the administration to say that there are, here's a partner, we got one for you. Go ahead, start working with them. How did they, how'd that happen? Where did it come from? It's like manna from heaven, a partner showed up. <laughs> Great. Um, the idea of approaching art as, as fundraising, um, I think it was Mallory, is that right? Mallory talked about David's workshop, where there's the idea that in understanding that when you're trying to get fundraising, that you are actually helping them, the people you're approaching, that they, the two, are going, have a mandate to give. How are you fulfilling it for them? And it led us to this understanding of exchange and reciprocity. That something has to be traded. Something has to be given back. And how can that be defined? So I know I can't get to it all. Um, I'm just looking over some of my images here. I want to leave with one thing that I believe was really important is that there is this, that the, it is not about solving problems. It is about asking the right questions. And I think that was a quote that I did grab onto from Susan Grossman. And that ultimately, this idea of families, we come from families, we understand families, that there is a sensitivity to understanding the family, even though you might not agree. And that learning that ability to be able to speak to one another in that respectful way, in that reciprocal way, and that being able to actually figure out how we can potentially work and with dissenting moments becomes very, very important. And I like to leave one thing that was very important is that a lot of these types of ways we teach are about dialogue and about dialogical ways of moving. And dialogue, as it was pointed out, doesn't have to be purely people talking. That arts-based process is a way to build metaphors, the way to connect people, to understand the, the huge gaps and uh, that are between different people. And I want to leave one image to you. <laughs> one image. That image is this. Mimi shared this with us. This image of a sailboat, a series of sailboats, and I've changed in the context, and I hope I have license to do this, a series of sailboats and somebody blows. And we actually inspire those sailboats to sail away. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And I'd like to thank all four witnesses, Simon Levin, Claire Robson, Terry Hunter, and Kamala Todd. We're moving to the open discussion now, and so I invite Jill Weaving and Marie Lopez to lead us in the discussion.